So, so that's a good way to open, right? You're all doing it wrong. Um, <laughs> so you spent the last couple of days probably mainly concerned with quantitative large data sets. Um, I spend most of my time, as Alistair said, talking to humans in rooms, uh, which is a little bit different. So I work with qualitative data. But I think that there are kind of 10 problems with the way that we collect and analyze qualitative data that may be mirrored in some of your processes for collecting and analyzing quantitative data. So I want to take you through a few of those. Um, I'm Farah Bostic. This is the Twitter handle to heckle me at. Um, I run an agency called the Difference Engine. We work in the innovation space, so we do product strategy and design research with startups and large companies alike. Um, and we do that mainly to help figure out one of kind of three problems, how to improve what you got, how to develop something new, how to develop a better go-to-market strategy. That's, that's our kind of focus. Most of what we use as tools to do that, because it is an innovation space, is qualitative feedback because we don't have large data sets to study yet. We haven't built anything. Um, so that is a little bit about my background. Um, I've worked in traditional qualitative research companies, and I, I don't know how, oh, that's pretty legible, OK. Um, this is pretty much the process. Um, it's very traditional waterfall. So you start out with a brand or product team who initiates an information request to a research and insights group, who then writes a research RFP that gets sent to a market research company, who develops a study design, and once that's approved, sends that out to recruiters or a sample company or a field service in order to actually recruit and field the study. And those moderators who do the fielding do some analysis, feedback the information and the, to the research company who then develops a PowerPoint presentation that is emailed to the client and forgotten about 10 minutes later. So that's the process. And based on this slide alone, you can see why so many of my clients and people that I interact with start out with one chief complaint about qualitative research. And that is that it takes too long and it's too expensive. And what I usually do is say, well, if you do it this way, then it is. <laughs> because if, as you can see here, there's like a chain of three or four subcontractors just to get it done. Of course, it's going to take too much time and cost too much money. There are other ways to do that. And, and we work a lot on trying to kind of come up with uh, lighter weight ways of, of getting the feedback that you need. This, though, does set up a nice background for the 10 problems I want to talk about. And the first one is related to what I just said, that it is often done too late. You wait too long to collect the data, or you wait too long to look at the data to see what it actually has to tell you. And in this instance, what we see with qualitative is that it isn't used in the best place it could be used. Qualitative research is often best used in an innovation instance where we're so far ahead of actually building anything that it really is there for illumination rather than support, for inspiration rather than validation. And when it's used that way, it can be incredibly informative, incredibly inspiring, and give people all sorts of great ideas of what to build. Unfortunately, qualitative is used kind of like a very small sample quantitative study far too often, where we pull people in after you've already spent lots and lots of money building something or producing something, and then you want feedback. And this will come up again a little bit later in the talk, um, but it is a significant problem in the way data is collected qualitatively. The second problem is you sort of start out wrong about everything and don't realize it. So my favorite story about this, a few years ago, we worked with a company who specializes in taking care of people with Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. When we started out the process, we applied some heuristics from most marketing, which is that high involvement purchases, expensive, time-consuming ones, like buying a car or buying a house, usually involve more than one stakeholder and take a long time. So we assumed that because committing a loved one into care was both expensive and life-changing life or life-shattering in some instances, that this would be true here as well. We were about halfway through the recruiting process when we discovered that we were absolutely wrong about this. No one had a partner in this decision. Everyone was doing it by themselves. Um, what was funny about this was that both the CMO of the company and myself had gone through this particular process and just assumed we were the outliers. It turned out that we were the middle of the bell curve. Um, so frequently what happens when you start out with a qualitative study design is that you're making a lot of unvalidated assumptions about who your customers are, what their behavior ought to be, how the decision-making process should unfold, and that then you pursue a study design that is baked with those assumptions. Once you actually get into the environment where you're talking to consumers, often you suddenly find that you're getting responses you didn't expect because you were wrong about everything to begin with. <laughs> so that is a second problem that we encounter quite a bit. 
The third problem is that you hire someone like me to be empathetic with your consumers on your behalf. This is, at the risk of my business, a folly that I would really rather you all stop doing. Um, if you are a product owner or a product designer or a business owner, you should be directly encountering your own customers. You should actually hear from them and watch them and learn from them firsthand as much as you possibly can. I recognize that this is yet another task added to jobs that already feel like three or four full-time jobs anyway, and so I think the real solution is probably having more businesses that actually invest in building an actual internal research and insights team that is there to do the research and develop the insight and bring the rest of the team in on that rather than just field it out to market research companies. Um, <laughs> and thanks to Christopher for that great photo. Um, so the next problem is that you don't use the tools at your disposal to learn all you can. So one of the things that we frequently um, find with clients who are skeptical about doing qualitative-based research is that they are, like so many, um, perfectly willing to malign the focus group as a, as a method for collecting information. And I don't know whether it's because it's so easy or in spite of the fact that it's so easy, but nevertheless, those clients wind up deciding to do the safe route, what they consider to be the safe route, the most science-y route, and we hire a focus group facility and we sit in a focus group room and we do more or less a focus group, despite all of their reservations. Sometimes I think it's deliberate. It's a trap door through which I can fall at the end if they get feedback they don't like. Um, <laughs> sometimes I think it's just that they aren't familiar with the other tools. Frequently, the best way to figure out what someone is doing and why they're doing it is to both listen to the stories they tell about the way that they do things and then watch them do those things. So one of my favorite examples of this is a study that we did for a food marketer several years ago where we were asking people how they go about putting together a grocery list, if they made them, how they grocery shopped. I mean, it was just very open-ended. They did video diaries for us. We gave them a few tasks to complete, including their weekly grocery shop. Um, and one of the women who is, you know, her husband is holding the camera and she's talking and she's saying, well, you know, I don't, I don't even need a list because it's all right up here. I, I know exactly what I'm going to get. And so I'm just going to get ready to go to the store. And getting ready to go to the store involved opening every cabinet in her kitchen, opening both of her refrigerators, and then writing it all down, what was missing, and then going to look at the Sunday circulars to see what was on sale and jotting down a few of those things. She then takes the camera with her and very cleverly sort of mounts it on the, on the handle on top, of the, on top of the cart and trundles through the store. And she's documenting this whole thing. So about 50% of what was in her basket when she checked out was on the list when she walked in. The other 50% were things she changed out for something else that looked better, new stuff she hadn't heard of before, and then the artifacts of tiny hands. Her small children were throwing things into the basket, um, and we got to see the little hands throwing things into the basket. Um, so what was what was interesting was that we got a sense of her values and her beliefs about herself. She knows what she needs, and I believe her to be true, you know, telling the truth about that. That she doesn't make a list is obviously, in this instance at least, inaccurate. But what she's really doing is just sort of touching base with all of the things in her house and what's missing and what she thinks she needs. And then we could decide that she's a liar because she didn't buy the things that she set out to buy, but that's not really what happens. What happens is you encounter reality. She placed a bet on what she was going to buy, and then she bought other things. She was right about 50% about of the things that she was going to buy. That combination of having her reflection and her storytelling, her feedback directly in kind of a one-on-one -on -one way, and then also the observational research allowed us to learn a lot more about kind of what goes into the process of grocery shopping for a woman like her and what she needs in her home in order to help her do that than anything else. If we had just done focus groups, we would have just heard her tell us she doesn't make lists, and that would have been an incomplete picture of her life. So one of the big problems I see is that we use one tool, often not the right one, to figure out what we're going to do next, as opposed to using all the tools at our disposal or using the right tools. The next problem I see is that we rely too often on the horse's mouth, and this is related to that idea. You sit in the focus group room and you're waiting to hear them play back your brand values. You're sitting them waiting for you to play back the value proposition that you have in mind. This is 
not really the, the best use of your time. If they're just going to tell you what you were expecting to hear the whole time, you might as well skip it. The other thing is that we ask them to come up with ideas for us. And we recently did this with a client, a co-creation exercise with lots of consumers in a room, workshopping through particular ideas. And the one thing we had to keep doing was level setting with the clients that we're not going to build what the customers in this room suggest. We're going to take that as stimulus for figuring out what to build. So what comes out of this is not a feature set. What comes out of this is some thinking and some stimulus and some ideas for us to consider about what to build next. And the reason that that matters is that a lot of people like to quote me the Steve Jobs line about uh, you can't create new products through focus groups. A lot of times it's hard for people to imagine what they want before you've shown it to them, more or less, paraphrasing. So the first thing about that is that that's absolutely true. It is really hard for people to imagine a future thing that they want that is not just an improvement on the thing that they already have. But at the same time, it's not their job to do that. It's actually your job as a product owner or your job as a strategist or your job as an analyst to help figure out what to build. So we're asking people to do something that's frankly unfair, <laughs> and we should probably stop. Also, gifts are great. Um, <laughs> The sixth problem is, is also this, you listen only for what you want to hear. And I touched on that a, a moment ago, that I find frequently, and this is a peril of the focus group facility as well, we've got the mirror. Behind the mirror are my clients, uh, theoretically observing the focus group that is happening. And frequently what they are doing is what some of you in the audience are doing right now, which is looking at your phones or working on your laptops or thinking about what you're going to have for lunch. And all of those things are great, but they have nothing to do with what's going on on the other side of the glass, which is real people trying to help you solve a problem. And what I've noticed is this kind of uh, <laughs> sort of funny like pop-up thing that happens in the back room where I heard the thing I was here to hear, and now I'm done. Someone said what I wanted the answer to be, and now we're, so we're settled. Someone validated my belief, rightly or wrongly, positively or negatively, and so now I'm good. This, was, this focus group was totally worth the like $6,000 we spent on it. Um, but I'm not going to listen to any of the rest of it. <laughs> so that's a waste of time and money. And then we get to the end, and we trap what we've learned in a PowerPoint deck. Um, and what we've learned is often kind of incomplete, or at least not a complete reflection of all the things that we learned, and is frequently no better than reportage. It's, you know, this person said this, and this segment tended to agree with this statement, and these types of customers tend to prefer this feature over that feature, and it's all kind of summarized neatly. And the way that I often express this is that what I'm being asked to do when I create one of these decks is chew your food for you, and then hope that it still tastes good when I give it to you. <laughs> Um, and it often doesn't. So that's not an awesome way to share information. Um, and then we have the, th the correlated problem, which is that we kind of, it's a sieve. That PowerPoint deck is a very leaky sieve out of which comes a lot of information that could be useful later, but wasn't core to the objectives of the study at the time. So we'll be talking about the value proposition or we'll be talking about a particular feature, but we'll get all this feedback on price that wasn't the objective of the study, so it doesn't make it into the final deck. When you go back six months later wanting to do a price study, you can't really remember what you learned, so you do it all over again, and then you go, oh, we already knew that. And I get that feedback a lot, too, because you've already done six months before you met me a study where a lot of these questions were answered, but no one stored them in a useful place for you. Um, so, so this is a problem. Then, of course, we come back to the very beginning of qualitative data is small sample sets. We assume that if the sample is small, that it is therefore not statistically significant, which I hope all of you in the room know why that is not necessarily true. Um, but at the same time, there becomes this sort of doubt that, OK, that was 10 people in a room. How will that, extra how will that you know, extrapolate when we get to 1,000 people or 10,000 people? And that's a, a worthwhile question to ask, and there are follow-up tools that can be used to figure that out. But oftentimes, it is used as a reason not to learn the lesson or act on the lessons from the qualitative research, which is also a mistake. And then finally, and this is correlated to issue number one, it starts too late, um, is that you do what you were going to do anyway. <laughs> you set out to do the research hoping that you will hear what you want to hear so that you can do the thing that you want to do. You don't really hear it, but you can kind of make it work. And then you go off and build the thing that you're going to build anyway, launch the campaign you were going to launch anyway. And again, we've wasted about $60,000 in six weeks. So that is sort of the set of problems that I see in the process of uh, collecting and analyzing qualitative data. Most of it happens well before 
before we actually encounter humans. Um, and I assume that you encounter some similar problems in your work as well. But in any case, those are, uh, that's my story, and uh, that's my message. Thanks very much. <laughs>